So today we are going to study a very interesting topic which is the ECG. Now this is one topic that every doctor understands, practices and then forgets. So in order to understand ECG, we need to know the heart first. And once we know how the heart works, will we be able to understand and interpret the ECGs, right? So in the first chapter, we are going to dwell into the conducting system of the heart and then we are going to study how the ECG captures the heart activity from different angles. Let's begin. So the heart is essentially a mechanical pump. Now in order for a mechanical pump to pump effectively, it has to contract in a very synchronized manner. This means that the electrical activity needs to be in a very synchronized way. This electrical activity going through the heart that stimulates the contraction of the heart is interpreted and represented on a graph. This is called the ECG. The conduction system of the heart consists of very specialized cells which conduct the electrical impulse into the muscles of the heart in a very synchronized way, which is nothing short of a miracle. It begins with the SA node or the sinoatrial node located at the junction of right atrium and superior vena cava on the inner side. The SA node transmits this impulse through the internodal pathways, which are distributed through the right and left atrium, including the Bachmann bundle, which goes into the left atrium, until it ends onto the AV node. Now note that this current generated through the SA node cannot go into the ventricle through the AV junction or the atrioventricular junctions. It has to pass through the AV node in a normal heart for it to be transferred into the ventricle. From the AV node, the current passes into the bundle of his that goes down through the interventricular septum and divides into right and left bundle branches. Now the left ventricle is thick and it is larger than the right ventricle. So it carries two fascicles namely the anterior fascicle and the posterior fascicle. The right bundle branch distributes into the right ventricle. These branch-like structures that you see at the end of the bundles are the Purkinje fibers. fibers. These are the fastest conducting fibers and they distribute the current to the ventricular walls and myocytes. So the timeline of events follows from conduction system distributing the current throughout the heart and leading to the mechanical beat. Now in the conduction system, we have impulse generation, right? the automaticity or the spontaneous depolarization of the heart and we have the impulse conduction. Let's go straight to the impulse conduction first and then we'll jump to the impulse generation. Remember from the basic physiology at resting membrane potential, the inner side of the cell membrane is negatively charged. This is basically because of the sodium potassium ATPase as a result of which the inner side is negatively charged and the membrane is in resting membrane potential. This is the phase 4 of impulse conduction of a cardiac cell. The cardiac cell is comfortably resting at resting membrane potential until the blue colored wave of depolarization comes in. As a result of this impulse, membrane potential of the cardiac cell reaches a threshold of minus 50 from minus 90. And this is where voltage gated sodium channels are opened. As a result of which, the sodium pours into the cell membrane and this causes the membrane potential to become positive inside the cell. In other words, depolarization. This is the phase zero of impulse conduction through the cardiac cell. Once this wave reaches the peak, the sodium channels become inactivated and the potassium channels open, driving the potassium out of the cell. In other words, the positive charge out of the cell. So through phase one, you can see the black colored, there is reduction in the positive charge inside the cell, right? But still it is positive. Why? Because this is the time when calcium channels open up. So while potassium is moving out of the cell, the calcium is moving inside as a result of which the membrane potential remains static. In other words, plateau. Now once the calcium channels are inactivated as well, there is unopposed potassium efflux from the cell to the extracellular side, right? As a result of which the membrane potential goes back into negative reaching minus 90, which is the resting membrane potential. And this is how the cardiac cell returns back to the phase four of impulse conduction until a new impulse comes and depolarization occurs again. Taking this time to understand why nature has made AV node the slowest conduction part in the conduction system. So when the impulse comes from the SA node, there is a delay at AV node before it goes down into the ventricle. This gives an added time for the atrial kick to occur. Right? So during that delay in the impulse at AV node, the atrium contracts and it gives off 25% added filling into the ventricle. This helps the ventricle to generate 
bigger stroke volume in other words better cardiac output and Purkinje are the fastest fibers in terms of conduction this helps the ventricle to contract simultaneously in a well coordinated manner to generate a good cardiac output so you can see the miracles happening in the heart conduction system we will study the graphical representation in the coming episode once we have a better and clear concept of ECG and the conduction system but I am taking this opportunity so that you can relate the cardiac action potential with the waveform that is generated on the graph. Let's do that. Above action potential graph, you can see the blue colored wave. In other words, the impulse coming in to depolarize the heart. This impulse coming from SA node goes all the way down to the AV node. And this is registered on the ECG as a small deflection called the P wave. So we have already discussed that there is a delay at AV node. This delay is represented on the ECG as the PR interval. After the PR delay or the PR interval, the wave travels throughout the ventricle and causing depolarization. This is represented as the phase zero of action potential and deflection is seen on the ECG as QRS. So QRS basically represents the ventricular mass depolarization. This ventricular depolarization precedes the main ventricular contraction, right? Now remember, during this ventricular contraction, the atrial repolarization is already taking place, marked in maroon, right? But this repolarization phase of the atrium cannot be seen because it is being dominated by the large QRS complex. So after ventricular depolarization, the phase of repolarization comes, which is marked in maroon. This is called the T wave. So this T wave is followed by a red colored isoelectric resting membrane potential until the next impulse from the SA node arrives in the form of P wave and causing ventricular depolarization again. So a question arises, how does the heart automatically generate this blue impulse? Well, this is the automaticity of the heart, which we will study now. Now these specialized cells generating the impulse, once they are in the resting membrane potential, there are leaky sodium channels, which move the sodium inside the cell as a result of which the membrane potential continuously moves towards positive until it reaches minus 40 or the threshold level this is where the calcium channels open once the calcium channels open there is a spontaneous depolarization and after that spontaneous depolarization the calcium channels are inactivated and the phase moves into repolarization or phase 3 where potassium moves out and calcium is inhibited but it never goes below minus 60 because of the leaky sodium channels. In other words, you see that for these cells to depolarize, they do not require any external blue colored stimulus, right? So this is the automaticity of the heart. There are various focal points in the heart that can generate this automaticity. So SA node beats at 80 to 100 beats per minute. The AV node can generate beats at 40 to 60 beats per minute. Whereas the bundle branches can also generate 40 to 45 beats per minute. The ventricular mass itself can generate ectopic beats at 25 to 40 beats per minute. So why is SA node considered the primary pacemaker? Well, it's because it is the fastest, right? In order to understand this, let's draw the action potential of SA node and the AV node. Now we know that SA node is beating at 80 beats per minute, right? So the spontaneous depolarization occurring at SA node and for AV node, it is 40 to 60 beats. So it is relatively slower depolarization compared to the SA node. So once the beat of AV node is about to go into spontaneous depolarization, the impulse from the SA node arrives and this causes depolarization of the AV node. Thus, the AV node has to follow the orders of the primary pacemaker, the SA node, right? Now understand this in another way. What if SA node was diseased and it did not give away the spontaneous depolarization or the impulse? So the AV node would wait for the SA node. Once there is no extrinsic impulse coming from the SA node, the AV node would go into its intrinsic mode of 40 to 60 beats per minute auto generation, right? And ventricle would then follow the AV node at 40 to 60 beats per minute. This is the junctional rhythm or in other words, AV node becomes the primary pacemaker because the SA node is out of order. Now again, the nature has its own safety systems as a miracle. When SA node is out of order, let's mark cross on it. So the AV node would come into effect. If AV node is compromised, then the ventricles would start following the bundle branches at 40 to 45 beats per minute. 
And if bundle branches are compromised as well, then the ventricle would start beating at its own intrinsically driven 25 to 40 beats per minute. So this is an added safety system within the heart's conduction system. If the primary pacemaker fails, there are secondary and tertiary level pacemakers as well within the ventricles. So the currents moving through the heart are never unidirectional, right? It has to be understood in a form of 3D model where the currents are moving upwards, downwards, sideways from right to left, left to right, and anterior to posterior, and from inner wall to outer walls. This requires seeing these currents from all angles, which we do with the ECG. Now, if we cut the heart vertically and see the longitudinal or vertical or the frontal axis or the frontal plane of the heart, the current would be moving from upwards to downwards, from downwards to upwards, from right to left or left to right. Similarly, if we cut the heart horizontally, we will be able to see the currents moving sideways or from anterior to posterior and the currents generating from the endocardium or the inner side outwards. So in a 12 lead ECG system, the frontal or the vertical axis of the heart can be interpreted through six limb leads and the cross-sectional axis can be interpreted through the six chest leads, hence the 12 lead ECG. One very important concept comes here, which I will explain again in the next episode, is about how the heart currents are interpreted by the ECG diagnostic currents on the graph as positive deflections or the negative deflections. In other words, to a layman eye, the waves on the ECG, how are they positive moving upwards or negative moving downwards? So if I were to draw ECG current in purple and the heart's intrinsic current in red, so drawing ECG current from negative electrode to the positive electrode, now the red colored intrinsic heart current can simplistically speaking be in three positions relative to the ECG current. It could be moving in the same direction as the ECG current, it could be perpendicular to the ECG current and it could be moving in the opposite direction. So once the heart's red color arrow is in the same direction as the ECG leads purple current, it would generate positive deflection on the specific ECG lead. If it is perpendicular to the ECG leads current, it would generate a biphasic response on the ECG graph. right? And if the heart's intrinsic current is moving in the opposite direction, it would result in negative deflection on the ECG paper of that specific lead. right? Now let's see how we cover the frontal axis of the heart. There are six leads for that, three bipolar leads, meaning there is a negative pole and a positive pole, one, two, and three leads and three unipolar leads, also called the augmented leads, namely AVR, AVL, and AVF. They are the average of sum of two limb leads. I will explain that later. Do not feel overwhelmed by this. Just remember, there are three bipolar limb leads and there are three unipolar limb leads. Now, these directions of the leads that I'm going to show you will confuse you a bit, but I assure you within the next four minutes, you will be able to understand and gain the concept behind directions of these limb leads. So among the bipolar pink colored limb leads, there is lead one moving from right side of the heart to the left side in a horizontal position. Then there is lead two that is around 60 degrees axis to the heart, which is almost the same as the atrial axis. Then there is third bipolar lead, which is lead three. Into one was the first one to make these leads. And as you can see, this equilateral triangle between these three limb leads is called the Inthoven's triangle. Stay with me here because you will be able to gain the concept behind this. I told you that the augmented leads are basically the leads that make an average of two bipolar leads, right? So we have the AVL between lead one and lead three. We have the AVR that judges the average between lead 1 and lead 2. And then we have the AVF, that is the average between lead 2 and lead 3. You must be asking in your mind, why such complex leads and different directions, and why these specific directions? Well, to understand that, let's draw a circle around the frontal axis of the heart to cover the heart in 360 degrees, right? From 0 to 180 and then in minus back to 0. Now let's take these leads one at a time and place them within this circle. So lead one is following zero degrees horizontally. Lead two is at 60 degrees, which is roughly the axis of the atrium. Moving lead three now within the circle, 
and let's just get the augmented leads now. The AVL at minus 30 degrees, the AVF at 90 degrees, and the AVR at minus 50 degrees. Now, if you see it clearly, I said that the augmented leads are average of two limb leads. For example, the AVF standing at 90 degrees, the purple colored AVF, is the average of lead 2 and lead 3. The lead 2 being at 60 degrees and lead 3 being at 20 degrees. And similar is the case for AVL and AVR. So in this way, through 6 limb leads, we have covered essentially the frontal axis of the heart. As for the cross-sectional axis of the heart, 6 chest leads which are unipolar in nature carrying a positive electrode whereas the negative electrode is taken as the center point of the heart. right? Placing these chest leads on the frontal side of the heart to interpret the transverse currents within the heart, we have leads V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 and V6. Let's place the ECG leads now on a human being. Well, spare the details of the human being, he seems to be quite fat for his age. For detecting the six limb leads, we have four leads that are placed on the right arm, the left arm, the left leg and a neutral ground lead placed on the right leg. As you can see, and we have already studied how the Inthumans triangle and augmented leads are then generated through these four leads placed on the limbs. In order to understand the various chest leads, I am going to give them specific colors, blue for V1, black for V2, yellow for V3, V4 in green, V5 in orange and V6 in pink. Now before placing the chest leads, you must know the mid clavicular line, the anterior axillary line and the mid axillary line. Also, it's sometimes very difficult to feel the first rib. So the trick is to first feel the manubrium sterni or the angle of Louis and move the finger sideways. The first rib you will feel is the second rib. And below the second rib, there is second intercostal space, then third, fourth and fifth intercostal space. Now let's place the chest leads. The first chest lead, V1, blue colored, is placed on the fourth intercostal space on the right side of the sternum. V2, which is black colored, is placed on the fourth intercostal space on the left side of the sternum. V4 is placed on the fifth intercostal space at mid clavicular line. Between V4 and V2, we place V3, which is yellow colored chest lead. V5, which is orange colored, is placed in fifth intercostal space at anterior axillary line. Whereas V6, the pink colored one, is placed at mid axillary line, fifth intercostal space. So this is how you can see the chest leads help in covering the anteroseptal and anterolateral parts of the heart. In OR, we use the three lead system usually. So, with right arm, the left arm and left limb, Inthuman's triangle is easily completed. So, we can set the cardiac monitor at lead 2. Why? Because lead 2 at 60 degrees is in parallel with the axis of atrium. So, a lot many arrhythmias can easily be picked up with lead 2. Another orientation through three leads is modified V5. In this, the left arm electrode is placed at V5 position of the chest lead. This way, you can easily monitor lead 2 and set the cardiac monitor at lead 1, the lead 1 would become modified V5 basically and this would help in detection of the anterolateral ischemias. Now that we have covered the frontal plane and the horizontal plane of the heart, let's see how the ECG leads see the heart from different views. The anterior portion of the heart is covered through the chest leads, namely V1, V2, V3 and V4. How about the lateral wall of the heart? which I am highlighting in yellow here. Well, on the frontal plane, it is marked through left going leads, namely 1 and AVL. And on the chest leads, the left lateral portion of the heart is covered through V5 and V6. The leads that cover the inferior wall of the heart, which I am highlighting in blue, are the down going leads, namely 2, 3 and AVF. The anteroseptal area which the frontal plane is unable to cover is covered through the chest leads, namely V1, V2, V3, marked in red. We have seen that there are no leads attached on the posterior side. So how are we able to see the posterior wall? It is through the mirror image changes. This I will explain once we are studying the ST segment changes through the MI.